Good afternoon. I'm the chair of the C Committee on Governmental Operations, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleagues, Councilmember Power, Jaeger, Ku, and Ben Kalos. Today, the committee will hear six bills that are uh, principally concerned with increasing the public's access to laws and regulations that govern the city of New York. Intro number 1091, sponsored by Councilmember Ku, which uh, we're going to be hearing from him in shortly, will require the New York City Department of Records and Information Services, excuse me, and the law department to make available to the, to the public a searchable comp compilation of all executive orders issued by mayors from 1974 to the present. Uh, this must uh, indicate any executive orders that have been explicitly superseded and amended by a later executive order by annotating the su superseded or amended executive order. Intro number 1872, sponsored by myself, will require publication of, of unconsolidated laws enacted by the council. Unlike consolidated provisions of local law, unconsolidated provisions are not codifying either the administrative code or charter, but they still carry the force of law. This bill will require the law department to publish all unconsolidated local laws enacted after January 1st, 1985. Unconsolidated portions of local law enacted after that date must be presented as annotations to relevant amended sections, sections of the charter or administrative code. Intro number 1871, also sponsored by myself, will require a default severability clause for unconsolidated local laws. The severability clause provides that the legislature intends to preserve portions of enacted unconsolidated law, even if a court strikes down other provisions. The charter and administrative code already includes severability clauses that for those bodies of law, however, they do not apply to unconsolid unconsolidated laws. Intro number 1874, sponsored by Council Member Chin, will expand on existing notifications available from City Record Online by permitting individuals to sign up to receive notifications by either email or text message or both. Individuals will be permitted to limit their receipt of notification by relevant agency or affected community board district as well as by as well as by category, such as such as public hearings, agency rules, or procurement notices. The city record line would automatically sign up council members and community board for such notification, although they will be permitted to opt out. Intro number 1878, sponsored by Councilman Powers, will amend the City Procedure Act, which governs rulemaking <coughs> process for city agencies to grant express authority to all agencies to uh, promulgate rules before a local law effective date. This will eliminate the need to include a pre-effective date rulemaking authority clause in every local law pa uh, pass passed by the council, and we're going to be hearing from him in a bit as well. Finally, intro 1879, also sponsored by Councilman Powers, will standardize the process by which the mayors designate administrating uh, agencies. It will require that for every law or rule that requires the mayor to designate an agency to administer or enforce the law or rule, the mayor must make the agency designation in writing. Within 10 days of a designation, a copy of the document shall be published on the city's website and on the website of the agency and shall be electronically submitted to the speaker of the council. The mayor will also be required to publish past designations online and submit them to the speaker. I want to thank our committee staff, uh, Daniel Collins, Emily Forjohn, Elizabeth Cron, Sebastian Bacci, as well as my legislative director, Claire McLevain, for making this hearing possible, and they always do a tremendous, awesome job. With that, I want to hand it over to my colleagues for opening statement. I believe Councilmember Ku uh, has an, another uh, meeting, so we're gonna we're gonna start with Pete. Thank you, thank you, Chair Cabrera, and thank you, uh, Mr. Lewis from the. Uh, 
city uh, department and law department. Uh, I'm Councilman Peter Ku, yeah, I represent Queens. Uh, today I'm introducing intro 1091, uh, which is a bill I'm uh, to give the public access to the New York City executive orders. Uh, there, is there is currently uh, no means to search comprehensively for executive orders online dating back to 1974. Uh, to be honest, I'm actually surprised that this even needs to be a bill and that this is not already something that has been adopted voluntarily. In this age of, uh, in this age of transparency and public accessible information, allowing the public to search and view executive orders online is really the bare minimum we can be doing. This should be no different than what is already available via uh, Legistar on the New York City uh, Council's website, where anyone can view a bill as it moves uh, through the legislative process, amendments and all. If the public can view City Council legislative documents, we should be able to view executive orders just the same. Executive orders are enormously important to government operations as they show that as they show what unilateral decisions are made by the mayority. This information is key to understanding the policies and politics of our great city. And by compiling this information into machinable, readable formats online, it will help to hold our government accountable. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Lewis. Thank you so much. With that, I'll pass it on to Council Mark Powers. Great, thank you, and I'll try to be quick and get to the point, but I want to thank the Chair for the opportunity to speak about two bills that we're hearing today that I've introduced. The first would amend the City Administrative Procedure Act, known, formerly known as, normally known as CAPA, to grant New York City agencies the express authority to promulgate rules before a law's effective date. Often when we pass local laws that are drafted by the council, they specifically do grant that administrating agency's authority to do rulemaking prior to the date of a local law going into effect. This bill eliminates the need to do that for future bills by providing as a default the authority to promulgate rules before an effective date so we ensure that agencies are able to implement bills in a timely fashion. Practically speaking, we pass a law, we put an implementation date into effect. We certainly believe that the agency can begin the rulemaking process concurrently and uh, we are giving them express authority to do that. Second is to standardize the process by which the mayor designates and administrating agencies for new laws. The council often gives the administration flexibility in designating the agency that's responsible for administrating the requirements of a local law. How often we don't always know when that happens or which agency has been designated. Uh, it's also a matter of transparency. Members of the public may not be able to easily figure out what agency will be responsible for enforcement of local laws. And I can even think of hearings recently where different agencies showed up and there was a need to clarify who would be the enforcement action. I even have a bill where that happened. So um, this bill requires that for every law or rule that requires the mayor to designate an agency or office to administer it, the mayor may, must make a designation in writing and a copy of that designation will be published on the city's website and the agency's website as well as submitted to the city council. The mayor will also be required to review past des designations and publish them online. Uh, these small changes will do a lot to streamline the process by which bills we pass are actually implemented and ensure the public is able to hold government accountable and to have a clearer picture into the functions of government. Uh, alongside the other bills, I think this is a good package to help make our government work better and I thank the chair for hearing these bills today. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. And with that, uh, we're going to have our council uh, swearing in the administration. <clears throat> Do you swear to, that the testimony you will provide to this committee is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you will respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera, Council Member Ku, Council Member Powers, and other members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Stephen Lewis. I'm the Executive Assistant Corporation Counsel for Legal Counsel at the New York City Law Department. 
I'm joined today uh, in the audience right now by Ken Cobb of the Department of Records and Information Services and Janae Ferreira from DCAS. Uh, alongside me, Eric Cecil Henry, General Counsel of the Office of City Legislative Affairs. I'd like to thank the chair and members of the committee for inviting me here to speak about several bills relating to the city's legislative and rulemaking processes. The charter establishes the law department with the Corporation Council as its head. The charter provides that the Corporation Council shall be attorney and counsel for the city. Relevant to this agency's work is providing the public with access to complete and up-to-date versions of local laws and rules. In furtherance of this function, the administrative code requires the law department to post online a complete compilation of the charter, the administrative code, and the rules of the city of New York. As a result, everyone may access and view the provisions of law pertaining to the administration of city government. In addition, th separately, the administrative code requires that all mayoral executive orders be posted online. The bills before the committee today have several admirable goals. Some of them would enhance the availability of the city's laws and rules. <laughs> Others seek to codify practices intended to ensure effective administration of such laws and rules. We share these goals, and that's why the administration supports the, uh, the intent of these bills with certain minor modifications. I will first discuss uh, two proposals, one regarding the publication of unconsolidated local laws and the other addressing the online publication of mayoral executive orders. By way of background, with respect to the first bill, uh, for those who may not be familiar with this, an unconsolidated local law is one that has been enacted uh, by the city council, but is not part of the New York City Charter or the Administrative Code. Frequently, these local laws are, are of limited duration. Another common practice is to use unconsolidated laws to name city streets. What they have in common is that they are not encompassed in the Charter or Administrative Code, and thus not ex uh, easily accessible to the public. Intro 1872 would require that unconsolidated local laws enacted after January 1, 1985 be made part of the compilation of local laws and rules that is required to be published online. The bill would further require that for local laws that are partly consolidated and partly unconsolidated, the unconsolidated portions appear in such compilation as annotations to the consolidated portions. 1091 uh, would require the online publication of mayoral executive orders uh, from 1974 to the present in the same format as the existing compilation of the Charter Administrative Code and rules. The administration supports the laudable goals of both bills designed to increase the availability of and accessibility to the city's local laws, rules, and executive orders. Uh, there are uh, some significant operational challenges, particularly as to the required publication of unconsolidated laws and executive orders dating back many years uh, with annotations. We believe the best way to move forward on these bills is to craft the bills in the following way. First, we should prioritize the publication of newly enacted unconsolidated laws and newly issued executive orders. Next, the city should be given a somewhat longer period of time to publish and, uh, I'm sorry, to publish past unconsolidated laws and executive orders in the required format. There is precedent for this approach, Local Law 40 of uh, 2011 which added Section 3-113 to the Administrative <laughs> Code, requiring the posting online of executive orders and memoranda of understanding. Uh, local Law 40 set forth a phased-in implementation of the online posting schedule, both in the law itself and in the effective date. Uh, and speaking of that section, Section 3-113, we think it may be the more appropriate provision to amend in the way sought by MCHO 1091, rather than create an entirely new section uh, in Title Seven. Uh, we also support the goal of Intro t uh, 1871, which provides for the separability of unconsolidated local laws. A separability clause provides that if any provision of a statute is judged to be invalid or ineffective, this would not affect the validity of any other provision of such statute. This this type of separability clause already exists in Charter Section 1153 and Administrative Code Section 1-105 with respect to consolidated laws. We support this concept with respect to unconsolidated laws. Uh, we believe as a drafting matter, as a drafting matter, it may be better achieved by amending these existing charter and code provisions. Intro uh, 
1874, requiring the notifications for updates to the city record uh, be available by email and text message uh, to anyone interested in receiving such notifications. The administration supports this proposal, which would be implemented by DCAS. The Law Department has no particular uh, recommendations with regard to this bill, but DCAS uh, representatives are available to answer any questions you may have on that matter. Finally, we, we support the goals of the remaining two bills. Intro 1879 would require that with respect to any designation by the mayor of a particular office or agency to administer or enforce the provision of a local law, such designation be made in writing, published online, and submitted to the council. We believe this would help clarify lines of responsibility within the administration, promote transparency and accountability, and minimize administrative confusion. Intro 1878 would amend uh, CAPA which sets forth the rulemaking procedures applicable to city agencies. We believe that this bill is an attempt to codify existing law that governs rulemaking uh, to implement uh, provisions of local law. There's no question a city agency charged with implementing a local law uh, may begin rulemaking to implement that local law. However, there's also no doubt that an agency uh, rule implementing a local law cannot take effect prior to the local law taking effect. Uh, we'd welcome the chance to work with council staff on the wording just to very clearly communicate the goals that, that we support. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our views today. Happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you so much. Uh, I normally start with questions, but I'm going to pass it on to Council Member Powell. Thank you. Very, very, very kind chair that we have here, I must say. <laughs> um, I just, on the last bill, the one that you, uh, you mentioned related to granting um, authority to promulgate rules prior to the local law effective yeah. date, I, it's, I, it's a bill I introduced. It, it, do you see any downsides to doing it? And if so, can you tell us? No, I think, no, I don't, I don't see any downsides. We, we would like to work with the uh, Council in terms of just some questions of the wording, but essentially we are we are in agreement with that. Okay, that and what what and just just so I, I get some I think I, on I, the wording. I'm sorry. I, I think uh, there was just a, a potential confusion as to whether it meant uh, that the rulemaking could start even before the bill was enacted. I understand there's a difference between enactment and effective date. Just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Uh, maybe uh, over uh, over cautiousness. Just wanted to review with the council Got the it. language to make sure we're all on board. But sure. certainly conceptually, we're Got it. 100%. okay. Great, with makes you. sense. And one last question: We were at the State of the City last week. The mayor signs of ex executive orders. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a bill here from Councilmember Kuhn. Yeah. Not to jump, uh, yeah, he left. Um, uh, what happens to that? And, and somebody actually, in fact, tweeted out, uh, he might have been my predecessor, in fact, <laughs> tweeted out um, asking for the executive order, where could he find the language of that executive order once it was signed? So what is right. the answer to that question? Well, two where things. Uh, first, uh, under the charter, the mayor is required to file uh, the executive order with the city clerk, who has that on, on file. But in terms of uh, posting online, two things happen. It's posted. Uh, virtually immediately, I would say, I, I, I can't say the exact time period, but very quickly it's posted on the mayor's own web page uh, and, and the Department of Records also receives it and posts it on its web page, which includes executive orders going back several but is there, a, is there a requirement that they have to be posted online? Like well, it certainly it doesn't have to be posted on the mayor's news page, does it? It doesn't. It, the current law doesn't say exactly where it has to be posted. It does have to be posted online. It is posted online, and in this case, it's actually posted in two different locations. The mayor's the page, mayor's and, page and, the and the Department of Records page. Okay, got it. I, I, I noted that I actually looked yeah. for the executive order after that he asked that question, and uh, I did find the records page, but it seemed to be the archives of other mayors and was kind of hard to find and navigate. And an executive order has a lot of importance to the city, especially when you sign one. And, uh, in a public, in a big public setting like that. So I, I certainly, it sounds like you, you guys are supportive too, but I think that it does, uh, is one of the mayor's powers here that it feels like we need, we could, it should be at least easier to find and, and track. So I, I, I do appreciate that. Is there, um, uh, is there like, what, what are the labor and cost impacts of doing that bill? Uh, in terms of the executive order yeah. bill? Yeah. Uh, I think we'll have to uh, work a little bit with City Hall and the budget 
Office of Management and Budget in determining costs. I would say with respect to both that bill and the one uh, regarding uh, unconsolidated provisions of law, the main cost factor, if you will, is the fact that they are both labor intensive going back in time, not so much going forward, going back in time, someone will be looking at hundreds of executive orders and literally thousands of local laws during that time period to spot, well, in the, in the case of the local laws, to spot the cons unconsolidated provisions, see what their, figure out what their current status is, place them appropriately within the consolidated provisions of law, and then with respect to the executive orders, making sure they are properly annotated with respect to their current validity or not. So it's it's more of a, I think most of the cost is a, is a, the fact that it's a, it's a bit labor intensive uh, to get the job done going back several gotcha. decades. Yeah, yeah. You, you gotta go retroactively yeah. make sort of, um, one last question. What, what is it, you can, we're talking about executive orders, but what is the difference between a mayoral directive and an executive order? Uh, <laughs> Could be a fine line. I think executive orders, in, in our view, tend to be uh, of greater import to the public. Uh, mayoral directives uh, tend to be more uh, directed to agencies for their own internal processes, uh, so wouldn't have as much of an impact on the public at large, more about how you're doing things internally. Uh, so I, I think that's the basic difference, executive orders um, tend to be documents that are of greater public interest and import. And I, I'm sorry to ask a one more follow-up. Does if a new mayor comes in, and the mayor's prior executive, the prior mayor has an executive order, if that new mayor wants a, a directive, it sounds like they can kind of redirect their staff and agencies as they need be. But an executive order, they would actually need to do a new executive order to repeal. Is that or a law yeah. would have to change? Traditionally, traditionally going back several administrations, at least. Uh, the first mayor, uh, when a mayor comes into office, the first executive order is to, in fact, re-up all prior executive orders until So they the do need mayor. reauthorization then. Yes, yes, yeah. so the just to make sure, just to be sure that those old executive orders don't just vanish by virtue of inaction. So the first step, renew them all, then the new mayor gets a chance to uh, review them and see I like this one, I don't like that one, I want to change this one or leave that one alone. Do you, do you know which may executive orders between Mayor de Blasio and his predecessor were not carried over? <sighs> Upheld, uh, if you well, know. I, I don't know, I mean, again, I know the current mayor, the, his first executive order was, in fact, I, I believe it was on Inauguration Day, was to renew all, the, all, of, them, all, okay. all of them. And again, that's just a placeholder until such time as it's decided whether or not an old executive order should be continued or changed or revoked. Okay, thank you. Sorry to take up so, so much time. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna I ask more questions. But uh, um, uh, one is, can you, uh, the, just kind of maybe a follow-up question, but I just asked, can you give us an estimate of the number of mayoral directives issued by Mayor de Blasio and past mayors relative to the number of executive orders? I know that it is a much smaller number. I couldn't really tell you. We'd have to go back and 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 count. Okay. I, I know it's considerably fewer. Consum considerably fewer. Considerably okay. fewer. And is there any reason why 1091, the Council of Cruz bill, shouldn't include mayoral directives? Uh, I would say, again, uh, there are fewer of them, and they tend to have less import to the general public. Uh, so it may, those may not be as critical. Um, we. So okay. we have no, you know, particular advice beyond that. Uh, it's all, all I can say is uh, they tend not to be of general interest to the public. Okay. And is there, um, am I right, say, did, did, does the Department of Records take the existing executive, do they, when do they put them on, when do they put an existing mayor's executive orders online? Is it after they leave office? Uh, I believe, and, and Ken Cobb from the Department of Records is here, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Department of Records site includes the current administration along with uh, the older one. I'll tell you frankly, in my very quick search last week, yeah. I didn't think that was the case. I think I saw Mayor Bloomberg as the most recent mayor. Okay. So I, I would yeah, have can to have defer. Ken, uh, clarify for the record.
Thank you, Council Member Powers. Just to clarify. Um, just going to swear you. Just have to swear you in. Um, do you swear that the testimony you will provide to this committee is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you'll respond honestly to I council will. member questions? I will. And if you could introduce yourself. Kenneth Cobb, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Records and Information Services. Uh, just to clarify, on the Department of Records website, there's the government publications portal. And going in, I don't, if you go into the publications portal, type in the search box, executive orders, you will see 918 executive orders, every order dating back to 1954 when Mayor Wagner started the, the, the executive order process. Up through, I don't think the ones that the mayor signed last week are there yet, but definitely right up till that point, they're all there. Okay, I, I would note that I didn't think they were easy to find when I looked for them. I, yeah. It seems well like they required a search. It's a couple steps you have to go okay. into the couple. Why, did, why did they start 1954? We were asking that this afternoon, <laughs> and um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I will find out and let you know. He figured, Mayor Wagner figured out he could do something that without the legislative body or some <laughs> yeah. expanded power. Okay. Um, and um, do you track executive orders? Does law department and city agencies track the executive orders? And then how do you know which ones are superseded in whole or in part? Uh, we, well, Obviously, this new proposed local law would help in that uh, process. Uh, right now, uh, we m might mark our own copies just to try to keep track for ourselves. Uh, but right, there's no formal uh, annotation, if you will, uh, to keep track of that at the current time. And what gives the, what it gives the mayor, I'm, this is not a trick question, I'm just asking, what gives the mayor the op ability to do an executive order? It's in the charter. In uh, the charter. Okay. I forget the section, uh, maybe section eight, but uh, there is a specific reference to executive orders uh, regarding his, his administration. Okay, uh, I think that's all my questions, so thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, any of my colleagues have questions? Uh, Councilman Robert Yeager, before I go to Mike. Let me just say we've been joined by Councilmember Mozell. The wise Councilmember Mozell, yeah. my mentor. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just have a, have a couple of quick questions regarding uh, intro 1091 Councilman Coos bill and uh, intro 1872 Councilman Cabrera's bill. Uh, in your testimony, sir, you said the city should be given a longer period of time to publish past unconsolidated laws and executive orders in the required format. How long? Uh, we do not have a very specific deadline right now. We'd like to figure that out very shortly and work with, with council staff and coming up with the appropriate number. Uh, it is, as I said, labor intensive because we will have to literally look at thousands of laws uh, to figure out what is appropriate or not. And that's why I suggested we could, in fact, expedite some aspects of this on, in terms of going forward. We can do this very easily. It's really the retroactive look. Uh, get to that. And, and we think that uh, we need more time, but we'll-, we'll More time than 120 days. We, we may need more okay. time than 120 Fair days. Fair enough, and, and I agree. It it's, uh, goes back a long time, you may need more time. I wanna go to the sentence before that in, the, uh, in your testimony. Mm -hmm. First, we should prioritize the publication of newly enacted unconsolidated laws and newly issued executive orders. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you just alluded to that in, what you, uh, yeah. in your answer to my previous question. And so you agree with the goal, uh, the laudable in your words. Um, did you already start this? Uh, we have not yet started this. Okay. Uh, we um, have seen these bills and, and we think these are good ideas and, and look forward to so implementing them uh, if, intro, if we go forward. Intro uh, 1872 uh, was introduced yesterday. Um, so I understand with respect to that, that perhaps you haven't yet had the ability to weigh um, or to begin the process of, uh, of beginning the publication. But Councilman Coos' bill um, to require the publication of uh, mayoral executive orders, intro 1091, was introduced last uh, two summers ago, August of 2018. So from August of 2018 until today, the law department's position has been, I assume, something along the lines of 
you should prioritize the publication of newly issued executive orders, excising the words unconsolidated laws. If the department's position is that it ought to be done, and it's a good idea, and it's now a year and a half since the bill was introduced, I'm just curious how many of these in executive orders have already been published online by the law department. Well, I should uh, thank you for your question. I think the, what I was trying to get across uh, is that, of course, executive orders are already published uh, online. We have two different aspects here. One is changing uh, the underlying uh, system under which it's published. I was, I was referring more to the uh, annotations. Of course, the annotations, most of that work is, in fact, going back in time. The, the more recent executive orders uh, that have been around for the last year or so have not, in fact, been amended or changed. The work, the main work of those annotations, those will be the going back in time executive orders. And I think that's where the work is going I, I may to be, be completely wrong, so if I am, please correct no. me. But um, from any time that I recall ever having to research an executive order, I think I found it simply on the mayor's website, on the mayor's office website in a, as a press release, and it's been a scanned document. Is that wrong? Uh, the the is mayor's there, office... Well, let me ask it a different way. Well, I'm sorry. Let me ask it a different way. Where are they published on? The mayor issued an executive order six weeks ago, right. if he did. Where would that be published? Uh, that executive order is found in two locations. It is found on the mayor's own web page, as you say, a PDF, essentially scanned document. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Cobb referred to, uh, on the Department of Records website or portal uh, that has government publications, including executive orders going back to the Wagner administration. As a PDF scan document. Um, I would defer to Mr. Cobb on, on, on how that is. I don't think it's literally a PDF, well, but it's it's, it's... it's a picture. It's not a, it's not a machine searcher. It's not, it's not text Correct. Searcher. It's not... Yes. Somebody, somebody across the street is has this document on their computer. They print it out, they shove it in front of the guy, he signs it. How difficult is it to have that Word document sent over to somebody to publish it online? I mean, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not even trying to be facetious, I really just don't understand. They have this document, somebody gets it in an email, they, say, they, they tell the guy, hey, could you print this up, give it to the mayor, he's gonna sign it tomorrow. He signs it. In the meantime, there's a Word document, it's in your department, it's at the executive chamber, it's at the executive office of the mayor, there's a Word document. Why are these only being put out right now? I'm not talking about the elderly ones, you know, Ed Koch's executive orders. I'm talking about the ones that Bill de Blasio has signed. Why aren't those Word documents just being uploaded contemporaneously with their execution? And you may not know the answer. I, I'm just right. asking I, the I, law department because I because you're here. Right. I, I assume it's the, <laughs> I assume it's them across the street that are not doing. I it. would I would say simply that this is a good idea, and it's come to our attention and. We are supportive of the idea, and we're looking forward to implementing uh, so who the can idea. So to to, to, who can we talk to tomorrow? Um, uh, who can Councilman Ku talk to tomorrow to ask uh, that they take all these Word documents that have been floating? I assume the mayor has issued a number of executive orders over the last six years. Who can he talk to to ask them to, hey, can you just you know push send and have them put up somewhere on our uh, website? Council Member, I think uh, one of the staff may have the answer. Fabulous. I'm good with nonverbals, so yeah. I think uh, I don't appreciate that. It's good to get the answer. If you don't mind, um, I'm Andrew again, Berger. We're going to have to you first. My hand is up. Great. I'll tell the truth. I think, you you swear the truth? I think you're telling the truth, but I they promise. do this because they have to. Do you swear that the testimony you provide to this committee is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you will respond honestly to council member questions? I do. And if you could introduce yourself. So the difference between um, using a PDF, a scan document, and using a Word document is that Word documents can be altered if they are presented as a Word document, as opposed to a PDF, which is a scanned version, and somebody else can't go and change it with the PDF. So that's a very critical difference here. Okay. And, yes. and that's also, I should say, the protocol whenever entities are entering into, entering into various contractual arrangements, leases, um, all kinds of legal documents that we don't want mischief done after something is signed and somebody can go into a Word doc. I know it's a little 
technological. But if you go into a Word doc, you can change the actual words. Yes. And that's why we would never do that. We don't want to do that. No, nobody, we don't want to change any Word docs. Let me make a, uh, uh, an observation, if I might. Uh, here in the City Council, we're no geniuses by any means. Um, and, but we have a website as well. And on our website, when uh, one of my wise colleagues uh, proposes a piece of legislation and it gets introduced on the floor of the council, uh, you can see it on the website. You can download a Word document, but the text of it is also appearing on the page of the website. I've been doing it for the last half hour while you've been talking, reading bills that were introduced yesterday. Um, so I'm not sure that I understand the I do understand what you've said. I'm not sure why that's at all relevant to my question. I think the distinction is, if I may, I think the distinction is to um, while the legislative process is underway, such as when you see a bill that's being posted, right? And we use it all the time also, and we think the council has a great website. Um, that process would not necessarily be subject to a need for anybody to change the document for some purpose. When you're talking about a final executive order, you, that's all, all the work has been done on it, all the negotiating, it's the final document. It's at that point that there ought to be one right. final. But I'm not, and not to, not to quibble over this, but I'm, I'm not suggesting that you put a Word document on a website. I'm suggesting that the text of this PDF is existing in a very easily copy and paste it into computer code and put it on a web page. I'm not, I'm not a computer guy at all. I don't know much about this stuff, but every time you put a, a word on a website, it's copied from a Word document that's yes. written somewhere and typed in and then pasted. Okay. Uh, the, the, if, if I go to research uh, a section of the administrative code, I don't open up a Word document. I see the text on my screen. If I wish to copy it and put it into a document, I select it, copy, you know, control D, et cetera, and all that stuff, and put it into a Word document. I'm not, I don't, I, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm just saying that I, you know, I, that's, so. that's third grade tech stuff that we understand. I'm saying, why can't we get the words from the Word doc onto a page? How complicated is that? So, uh, uh, council member, um, thank you for uh, highlighting this. I think that um, traditionally the role of uh, the city agencies that uh, come before us today uh, to testify on the bills, they've been, uh, their, their mandate has traditionally been uh, to act as repositories for local laws, local regula uh, regulations, executive orders uh, for posterity, kind of aggregating and amassing this information uh, internally. If there's anything that we've realized from uh, uh, reviewing these bills is that uh, we need to do a better job of promoting transparency and accessibility for the general public. Uh, so just to uh, reemphasize, we do support uh, uh, the goals of these bills, and uh, we look forward to uh, talking with the council, talking with our, our sister agencies, talking with City Hall, talking to the OMB about how we can operationalize and really fulfill the goals of these bills in a really smart and thoughtful and strategic way. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. As a matter of fact, there is a way, uh, I believe, in Word uh, that uh, someone could uh, put the text and, and block editing. And so you could block editing. And I think also in PDF, there's a way to format it in a way that is searchable, because I think that's, that's the big issue here. So mm -hmm. um, if you could talk to the people, I guess, in... Uh, uh, who does your? Yeah, we, we're, we're 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 talking with uh, assist agencies such as Do It as to how we can really approach this uh, from a, a smart lens, uh, using the software, the hardware uh, appropriate to to fulfill the aims. Beautiful. I want to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Rodriguez, so I'm going to uh, bring in uh, the tail end of uh, some of the questions here. Uh, that we definitely need some information. So regarding uh, intro 1871, uh, my bill, uh, to your knowledge, has an, an unconsolidated local law or an unconsolidated portion of a local law been the subject of a legal challenge in court or even struck down in court? Uh, thank you. I don't recall such an instance. 
but seeing this legislation, we think it is very useful because mm -hmm. it certainly is something that could come up, so we'd rather right. act proactively than wait for that problem to That's occur. Good. That's good. That's uh, good uh, for us to be proactive. Uh, jumping uh, to intro 1872, uh, can the law department rely on resources la like Westlaw to minimize the labor involved in annotating the administrative code and charter with unconsolidated provisions? Uh, thank you for that question. We are going to be discussing this with American Legal Publishing. It is one of the uh, leading companies of online uh, publications of municipal and other uh, government codes. Uh, so we have a current contract with them. They are the ones who provide the current online service. Uh, so we've already started talking to them about how to implement this in a smooth and efficient and cost-efficient way as possible. Fantastic. Uh, beyond effective dates, should any other unconsolidated provisions be excluded from the requirement that administrative code and charter be annotated? Uh, thank you. I, I, I think the uh, bill is currently drafted, sort of draws the proper line. Uh, sometimes there are unconsolidated provisions of law that combine effective date with other provisions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will have to look at those closely and determine what the best way of, of annotating uh, the administrative administrative code or other laws to, to reflect that uh, circumstance. Let me jump to uh, uh, some questions related to Council Member Chin, uh, intro 1874, the city, the city record online already allows people to sign up for email notification, does additionally allowing them to sign up for the text message notification presented any technical or cost concerns. So uh, we'd like to bring up uh, Jene Pereira from uh, DCAS City Record to uh, answer that question. Okay, Jene, we're gonna have to throw you in as well. Do you swear that the testimony you will provide to this committee is truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, and that you'll respond honestly to council member questions? I will. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, as you stated, we do um, currently offer email notifications for, for City Record Online. Um, in terms of text notifications, we are currently discussing the steps that we would have to take to implement this. Uh, right now, we do feel that uh, we would be, we would need to have some implementation for SMS notifications. Um, but in terms of resources, we're still in we're still in the development stage of trying to figure out how we can implement that. Okay. Do, and do you know? And this might be a premature question since you're searching, but would there be any costs associated to it? We're not sure about that yet. Okay. Thank you. But we'll definitely let you know. Okay. Um, the city record online already allows people to select to receive email notifications by specific agency. Uh, would allowing people to select notifications only for certain types of documents from selected agencies, for example, only proposed rules, introduce technical or cost concern? Um, that is something that we would have to sit down and discuss. Okay. Uh, how many unique profiles already uh, so already subscribe to Crow? So we have uh, just over 37,000 unique uh, users that are logged in through the nyc.id uh, application where they can log in to other applications and use the same login information. Um, and there are just over 13,000 that are subscribed for notifi email notifications currently. Okay, that was helpful. Uh, we noticed Crawl does not allow city employees email address to create profiles. Why is that? <laughs> we are very curious. <laughs> and must city council members, let me just ask these, they are related. Must city council members and the staff or community board employees use their personal email to receive not notification? And how do you intend to automatically register council members and community board district managers uh, 
uh, which is required by the bill, uh, without being able to use their NYC employee email address. So thank you very much for that very important question. So actually, you can uh, sign up for notifications with your uh, government or your your city employee email address. So the issue is that the city employee is trying to log in, they're trying to sign up. So they go in to sign up and then they want to select the notifications. But what they actually have to do is the city employees are, are already technically signed up through the NYC.ID program. So they have to actually log in and then opt into the notifications. So they technically are already subscribed. So we are currently working with the Crawl IT team to, to figure out how we can better implement the instructions so that the employees know um, exactly how to go into that. That's in. great, that's great. Yeah, information I think will be very helpful because uh, I know s our staff <laughs> had difficulty uh, doing so. And I believe I have one last question. I think there's gonna be a record hearing. <laughs> um, and that is uh, related to Councilman Powers. I know he had to step down. Uh, this other hearing is going on, but he wanted me to ask what labor, and this related to intro 1879, what labor and costs will be involved in reviewing past agency designations and reporting them to the council? So, uh, in regards to uh, 1879, uh, again, I want to uh, reaffirm uh, that we are supportive of uh, what the bill uh, aims to do. Uh, I think with any change or increase in uh, agency mandate, we have to take a hard look at what the what resources, technical, operational, fiscal, might be required to fulfill the goals of that mandate. Uh, so we've already begun those internal conversations. Uh, or as the uh, course of the bill ne negotiations progress, uh, we should be able uh, to have a, a dialogue with council as to what would be needed. Okay. Well, I want to thank you uh, for that discussion. That the discussion already has taken place and will continue to move forward. I know these are not uh, often known as very uh, exciting bills uh, to the public, but they are very important in order to achieve the end, uh, which uh, you mentioned earlier, which is uh, at the end of the day is all about transparency and being able to gain accessibility with the least amount of clicks as possible or even to make it possible. So uh, with that, I wanna thank uh, the council uh, staff for a great job, and as always, Councilman Yeager, who stays to the very, very end, faithful and true. You're a, t a true trooper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank and you, Councilman Yeager. Thank you. Thank you.